Welcome to Wild Inside with Ellen Sentier and Robin Harris, a series of conversations exploring our inner wildness and the interconnectedness, wisdom, joy, and wonder that it holds for us. Well, you're getting a pair of grinning women at you. It's fine. I'm the Ellen part of it, and this is Robin. Lovely to be here. It is. And we don't, well, we do know why we're here. How did we get started, Robin? I can't remember. Did you reach out to me or how did that work? But basically, we had a one to one and got talking about wild. We did. Yeah. 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 And about wilderness. And about being wild. Yeah. A very good idea of being wild is. And so we decided that it would be nice to talk to lots of people about being wild. And it seems from the response we've both seen on our social media telling you this is going to happen, um, that lots of people are going to be quite interested. So we hope you're going to enjoy this. And we set off this afternoon. It was, it's, doesn't this always happen? Um, I turned the uh, Zoom on and it suddenly started recording. We were neither of us ready. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got an extra bit beforehand, which we're going to have to lose. And we sort of began with my cat deciding she wanted to come in. No, she wanted to go out. No, she wanted to go in. She wanted to come out. And then you said about, about, about my joke. About St. Peter. Why they have nine lives. Yes. Did you know what cats have oh, lives? Yes, because you know cats. You open the door. Are you in or are you out? Are you in or are you out? Well, when they go to the pearly gates and Peter is there, are you in or are you out? Are you in or are you out? <laughs> and they decide to go back. So they have another life. Yep. And another and another. Yep, yeah, and it keeps on going like that, which then took us into um, something from long ago, which we both love, which is the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Now, some of you will remember this, and if you don't remember it, um, go and look it up. There's lots of good bits on YouTube, and it's fun. It's completely mad and incredibly sane because of that. And so I said, well, St. Peter must be like Marvin then. <laughs> Marvin is the paranoid android who runs everything, runs the spaceship, gorgeous critter. And he would, if you've read Winnie the Pooh, he is Eeyore, isn't he? He is he absolutely is Eeyore. Eeyore. He is. Absolutely. Yes. Eeyore. No, no. And he sort of goes around, Lo, don't speak to me about Lo. And then he sort of say, brain the size of a planet. And what have they got me doing? Opening doors. <laughs> so I feel they must have had a cat, you know. Oh, well, they? yes. Yeah. But another similar similar character might be Charlie Maxey of The Boy, The Mole, The Fox and The Horse. Yes. The mole. Yes. Who gets overtaken by things like cake. And then he just has to eat the cake. Oh, I love The Mole. We all understand that, surely, don't we? Oh yes. I mean, and this is part of this is part of your inner wildness. Because it, it takes you over. And you've got to eat the cake. I mean, what else is the cake there for? <laughs> to be enjoyed. Exactly. Which takes us back to the restaurant at the end of the universe. Many ways. It's confusing. And there are all sorts of things as well as cake there. But then you asked me if I was a poopy fruit. Who knows what that is? Can you tell us? Probably people of a certain vintage know <laughs> what that is. <laughs> but shall I give you a little clue? A hoopy fruit is somebody who knows where their towel is. Absolutely. And, and if you want to know more about that, you probably just need to go and read yeah, a little bit of yeah. this sane insanity. But it has to do with dolphins um, who left the planet before it got all blown up um, with a big 
sort of starburst across the sky saying so long and thanks for all the fish (laughs) and of course I have to have this so I have my mug (laughs) and in the case of wildness now this is what wildness this is one thing coming to another thing wildness that brought me in fact won me this Now that is an obsidian knife with a deer handle handle. And this is beautiful obsidian. If I turn it slightly, we might be able to get some of the colors. Yeah. Yeah? Just a bit. And it was made for me by a dear friend who is one of the best nappers in the country, if not the world, a man called Will Lord. He's completely nuts he's absolutely gorgeous and he does loads of living history and his dad was a flint napper and his dad was actually in charge of um what is the flint mine in the in in east anglia oh it'll suddenly come back to me it's terribly well known and it was so well known in um neolithic times that they used to have festivals and people will bring things to it and from it. And it's huge. And I've actually been. So, and he's now in charge. Will Will is now in charge of it. But Will decided that he also wanted to nap this. And this is volcanic glass. And it, he hasn't made it super sharp. He slightly blunted it for me. Otherwise, just to do that, and I'd have blood all down my finger. This is sharper than any steel. It's absolutely wonderful. And he makes these things, and there's a group of us who've all been there and got involved. And so he did this crazy quiz one night, and we were all online answering it. And we got to about the last question, and it was, would you like a weekend with Will Lord or a weekend with so-and-so or um, such and such? And to do this, what do you actually need for this weekend? You know, you need your axe, your knife, and and so I just said, and your towel. <laughs> because you cannot go anywhere without a towel. You must not panic. And you no, must but you must carry your towel. Your towel. <laughs> so, um, it actually, it won me this knife because everybody agreed that I should get the point for that. And that was just enough points that I got most points and I won this knife. So how about that for World Connection? Fantastic story. Isn't it? And we we go everywhere like that. Because you've got your own world stories as well, haven't you? But... We all have because there is wild in all of us. And when you posted on LinkedIn earlier and I was saying how much I was looking forward to doing this with you and you said about having an enchanted forest within. Absolutely. Yeah. And that to me was just so magical because we do. We have this forest. We can go to this forest at any time we choose. And I guess it's like any forest. It depends on the weather, what what the mood of that forest is. Or I used to love the sea and just anybody who lives by the sea or lives, you know, works on the sea or whatever will know the sea has moods. The sea Mm. has uh, a beingness and she's a she and it depends on where you are in the world what the sea around you is like are you for me I w- lived in Ireland I grew up in Ireland and we holidayed on the west coast so that's the Atlantic so powerful massive great big voice versus my stepson now lives on the Pacific the other big one of the other massive great big oceans and it's very different very different character yeah yeah so all of what wilderness is like this it has its own being it has its own character it has its own moods Mm. and for me part of wilderness and wild is being able to embrace all of them yeah Yeah. the ones that we find scary and crazy and fun and uplifting and 
the Marvin ones and the Eeyore ones and the Mole ones, yeah. as well as the ones that are easier to embrace. Mm -hmm. And this is something we've talked about as well in terms of just animals yeah. and and plants and things that we as humans maybe have said, we don't want those and we do want those. Mm -hmm. And we like the nice and fluffies, but the other things we find more difficult. Mm -hmm. And then we distance ourselves. Whereas it's the whole, and I, I love that with plants as well. We know now that hawthorn is very good for circulation. Yeah. And apparently there has been a lab in Germany that has tried to isolate the particular element compound mm -hmm. within hawthorn that does that. Mm -hmm. And every time they think they find it, yeah. they trial it and it doesn't work. Yeah. Because it's the synergy. It's the whole. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole thing and there's the whole um, Hammer Horror Films, Hollywood werewolf thing, you know, and one of the ways you can kill a werewolf is with a silver bullet. Um, there are all sorts of scientific reasons why that is a thoroughly bad idea to even <laughs> try it, um, but we won't go there for the moment. But there are no silver bullets. And when we try to isolate one thing, we usually wreck it. And the whole of the hawthorn plant is very good for you in all sorts of ways. They did the same thing um, with cancer and mistletoe, didn't they, years back? And again, you, you've got, you can't just have one thing, um, which actually brings me to a man that I learned about through my husband, um, who is an ex-particle physicist. Yes, it's fine. I had quantum with the cornflakes for 50 years. It's fine. Um, you can actually talk about it like the cat sat on the mat, so you can actually understand. Um, but he introduced me, not personally, but to this man called Kurt Girdle. G-O-E-D-L. And I think I pronounced it right. And he, in the 30s, I think it was, is mathematician and all that kind of stuff and in the Einstein League, um, you know, mates with. And he developed this theory, which is much used now and is much used in computing and both hardware and software side. And it's called the incompleteness theory. And he has proven scientifically, so we'll take up, sit up and take notice and mathematically and I will take notice of that and he's proven that you cannot find the answer to any one thing only using its own discipline you must bring in outside uh, I can't tell you the theory and all that but if you're really interested start with start with wikipedia and move on through that and you'll 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 get the whole thing and there's, again, there's good programs on um, YouTube, which will show it to you. But I just love this. And you first, because I've always sort of thought of it, but not having any maths or anything. I didn't know any about this book. And he says it. So it isn't just ordinary people. It isn't just woo-woo people who talk about incompleteness. All the respected scientists know this too. So you can't have this one thing in Hawthorn. You've got to have Hawthorn and its bits and where it's come from. And I, I don't know, have they decided that they also need to know like when to pick it and when to process it and all that? That's certainly, from a lot of perspectives, that's a huge part of it. It would be, I would certainly go along with that. Yeah. But I love that idea that there is scientifically known by the top people, who the respected people in that field, yeah. that everything really is interconnected. And I know we know it in nature. Yeah. And David Attenborough definitely Absolutely. would be telling us yeah. that you can't change one thing without changing everything else. Yeah. And that we are dependent on everything, even the things that 
we wish we didn't have. Yeah. I was talking to somebody earlier today, telling them about this and saying, oh, well, there's the example of the wolves in Yellowstone. And the, I think the the wolves changed the t the course of the river, something oh, title awesome. like this. It's, it's more of a film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. On YouTube. Yeah. There was also the vultures in Africa that they removed and then people got sick because the water got polluted because the vultures weren't there to clean up the carcasses. So everything, and, and wasps, a lot of people struggle with wasps, yeah. but they have a purpose. Yeah. They they have a role and little small furries that a lot of people find challenging to have them around their house or whatever. They yeah. have a role, they have a place. We humans are the ones that put things out of balance. So then their numbers get out of balance. Yeah. But I just love that everything is interconnected and we can't separate it out yeah. because then it is incomplete. It is. And that I am so pleased like you that because people need scientific proof a lot, they, they don't feel they can trust other things. And you've got this, that you can say, no, we are whole. So we are wild inside, like the sort of lunatic conversation that we started off with here. And neither of us would be happy or be us or be feeling good if we weren't able to have lunatic conversations every now and again. What is life without a bit of fun? Exactly. Without a bit of silliness. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we're back to Marvin again, aren't we? <laughs> No, don't speak to me about life. About life. <laughs> <laughs> but that just goes to show how important fun and silliness is. It is. It is. And somebody says something funny, something, somebody does something humorous. And it's so good because everybody's been there, really sort of make, maybe taking real note of this. Had this in um, a, a thing I went to a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it was about speaking engagements and this sort of thing. It's a, it's a course. It's a Toastmasters course. It's really nice, fun. And our Toastmistress, Toastmaster, lady, Toastmaster, um, she was giving the final bits on oh. the three people who had done their speeches that night, which was very good. And she was giving the speeches. And so she did the first one and then she did the second one. And then she said, and now it's time for the tea break. And there was a sudden oi from the audience. And she went, oh my God, I forgot you. And she'd forgotten the whole person. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, clang, you know, crash. But everybody was sort of <clears throat> laughing with her. And she went, oh my God, like this, you know. And she totally sort of said, oh, I really screwed up there, didn't I? And was admitting it and was being fine with it. And the person who it was said, well, it's all right then, but you better talk about me now. <laughs> and everybody was laughing again. And that was because we all, I mean, who hasn't been in that kind of situation at some point in their life? And you've just gone, oh, my God, what did I just do? <laughs> and we've all done it. But we were all right with it. We weren't sort of blaming her or pointing fingers or being nasty. And that was partly because she saw it. She apologised yes. profusely and she laughed and said, I'm really sorry. What am I going to do? You know, and he says, talk about me. <laughs> says this bloke from the back. Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> and it's such a, a, a gentle, graceful way of working with what yeah. has happened yeah. yeah and i think more and more that it's not what we do it's how we do things and not what response we make but how we respond yeah. 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 and and how we are graceful to ourselves so yeah. she was being graceful to herself and not beating herself up she was oh my goodness look what i've done yeah. but at the same time being able to be light yes. about it yes. and then everybody else took their cue from her and followed along and laughed and he made a joke of yeah well you can talk about me now 
that's how to get around this that's how to get through this situation so absolutely and that humor that is part of our interconnectedness isn't it and it's part of keeping things light and joyful and we learn much better when it's light and it's joyful and we're playing look at animals how they play in order to learn yes and we're no different we're another animal we learn so much better when we're being playful and keeping it light and we want to remember it then so it's not like she's made that and it's going to be there hanging over her forever she's made that mistake Mm. she was able to laugh it off that's a great it was it was really lovely role modeling yeah it was it really was I mean you sort of thought yeah I'm really glad you're there and thank you for that and I mean we all sort of said you know thank you for doing it because you've just shown us what to do when we do it because we know yeah. we're going to do it and it's this whole thing <clears throat> for me life is about threads and our interconnectedness is threads and we're back up again to the plants in a way aren't we because we're mm-hmm. in what they call the mycorrhiza which are these fungal yeah. threads which go for miles and miles hundreds of miles and they connect everything up and they call it the wood wide web because yes. <laughs> all, all of the plants talk to each other through these threads like our own internet and then you see it again in in astrophysics where you get these wonderful pictures of the the cosmic web and they call it the cosmic web and it's huge network which is sort of billions and billions and billions of miles wide and it's connecting through the light of these stars and we connect the same way and when um sam that was the lady's name did her cock up which is wonderful and you know did her heart opening oh my god what have i done she just sent these threads out to us saying things like i'm really sorry i screwed up but you know help me please guys you know i you know don't shun me don't push me away and we all came back with it's fine it's really funny and made jokes about it And there was this all this sudden connection again. And it was just energy, whatever you want to call it. Um, But we did it. And it's because she was able to offer it out to us, her problem. Mm. And we just came back and said, no problem, lady. It's fine. And it reminds me of Brene Brown and her talk about vulnerability. Yeah. She stood up there in a vulnerability. I've made a mistake. Yeah. But I've just recently finished listening to the audiobook of another of Renee's books, mm. Braving the Wilderness, mm. which is all about that uncertainty and that unknown. And how can we stand up in courage, knowing that vulnerability can be strength, even though we're feeling like this could totally ruin me, people could shoot me down, yeah. people could hate me, all those things that run through our heads because... Yeah, that's just the way we've learned to think. Yeah, and to be able to stand up there and go, "Yeah, I made a mistake," mm-hmm. and actually, I know it's okay to have made that mistake, and I am choosing to be okay with the fact that I made that mistake. Yes, and to yeah. own own my vulnerability and be strong and courageous in that, and to share that with you, yeah. and to connect with you because the thing that we all have in common is our humanity. Yes, our vulnerability. Yeah. And it is so important that, and both Robin and I love and watch and live with animals, um, wild ones and ones who've chosen to live with us. I don't like calling them pets and tamed, and I know you don't either. They're ones who've chosen to be with us. And, they share our lives with us. And for which and some of them share our homes. And we feel very honoured that they have mm. chosen to do that because they could all walk well certainly my cat could because cats will walk away um and they've done that they've come to us and they screw up um my cat sometimes screws up but she's got she's got some she was she's a feral cat she's rescue i always rescue because i can and they need someone who can and so she was about seven or eight months old when I got her and she'd been thrown out because she got pregnant which is normal people do that really yes they do and she'd had two lovely kittens and she'd done her kittens and now she wanted a home she'd also got the added disadvantage for cats in that she's black 
And there's a whole load They're the of best. Well, exactly. But there's a whole load of, oh, black cats are evil, magic, you know, nasty, don't want that. And so she got much less chance of having a good home than a nice tabby cat or a ginger or something like that. Not for me. I love black cats. So it's fine. I've Um, had two rescued black cats. They're my thing. Absolutely gorgeous, aren't they? And anyway, she came out and she was she is a survivor. She wasn't caught until after she'd had the kittens. And she was feeding them successfully, living in the back streets of Hereford, off rubbish. Now, that's going some. And, you know, when the uh, Cats Protection caught her, they was like, mm, you know, Kit's going to be all right. They were fine. She was a little thin, but she was fine. So she's very feisty. And when cats play, they will quite often bite each other and wrestle and this is all very well but you know I don't have any fur and and, and my skin is really thin compared to hers and so you'd be stroking her back and she'd be oh this is magic absolutely don't stop and then she'd get really excited and so she'd bite me and I don't know whether you know, well, you probably realise this, but a cat can um, crack the skull of a rabbit with the pressure that they can produce for those jaws. And they're very, very sharp. So it's sort of like, I really quite like to keep my thumb kind of thing. (laughs) So instead of sort of pulling it away and shouting at her, um, which is partly what she'd had before, if anyway, if you pull away... Cat's teeth are like this. So you pull away and they're going to dig in deeper. Same Mm. with claws. So don't, because you make it worse. But she's a mummy cat. And so I was like, ow, ow. You know, like a kitten. And she just dropped me and looked at me and went, what? (laughs) And I said, it hurt. You know. And I'm sure, oh. And then she licked it. Um, because she still does it occasionally or tries to, but now she knows that she's biting a human. So I just get held. I don't end up blood, <laughs> which I did the first time. Um, and it was this, she was there like, I made a mistake. I thought you'd be all right. Um, but, you know, aren't you a sort of cat? You know, not very good one because you can't hunt and you're no fur. You never lick me. And and you have to take your fur off to go to bed every night. For goodness sake, really? I know. You <laughs> um, humans, you, you just fat knew, so much. She knew she'd made a mistake. Mm. And she didn't grovel at me or anything like that, but I didn't make her grovel. Um, it was just like, that hurt. And she understood hurt because she gets hurt. And it was like, oh, okay. And then it was the next time, it's sort of, how's that? Can you manage that? No, that was still a bit hard. And now she knows how to bite. And she knows not to do it to humans because humans are totally ineffectual creatures with no fur and rubbish skin and la la la, all those sort of things. One but of them she knows all, how, how far to take her play. She does. And she's learnt that. And she was quite upfront. I mean, she didn't try and hide that. She didn't sort of say, well, it's okay. You're supposed to like biting, you know. She just went, oh, really? I won't do that hard again then. Yeah, okay. Well, you know, thanks for telling me, almost, <laughs> sort of thing. And animals do that. And you've got horses and you see it, don't you? Absolutely. You watch any group of animals, so whether it's kittens or puppies or a herd of horses or whatever it is. They teach each other what's acceptable behaviour and what's, no, that's too far. Yeah, yeah. No, that's really too far. Stop. Yeah. And when we had a cat before the dog that we have at the moment, she was very much a teacher to me. Yeah. How do you own who you are without feeling that you have to apologise for it? Yes. Yeah. You don't have to push it too far. Mm-hmm. But neither do you have to back down. And Brene Brown talks about don't puff up and don't shrink down. No. Yeah. Don't armor up. Don't feel that you have to be overly defensive. Yeah. 
and there was another part where she was talking about hard back, soft front. Mm -hmm. So stand strong. Mm -hmm. Don't be a pushover. Don't be apologetic, but still keep your vulnerability, keep your gentleness, keep your grace, nice. keep your softness, keep your warmth, mm. if that's a part of who you are. And it don't is... hide it, don't feel that you have to cover up or excuse it. Mm. And most people, when you actually get to know them, they are that warm person inside, mm. but they may have had to shield it so much that they've got armour plating all around them. Yeah. And that makes them, it's very difficult to talk to somebody when they're in armor plating, isn't it? Well, they're in fear yeah. when they're in that state. So it's very difficult for them to open up and be receptive and make that connection in order to have the conversation. Yeah. There are some people who are more naturally maybe assertive or their energy is more outgoing and they don't come up, you don't see the warmth initially. Yeah. But it, you're right, it is there when you make that connection on the, we are just both humans yeah. on this journey together yeah. and it's the same with any animal because you you will see on there's loads of things that go around facebook and so on of cats playing with dogs and yeah. cats playing with mice and cats playing with dog uh, with birds and yeah. and they are a dog playing. licking a horse yeah. and a horse licking a dog and yeah. yeah animals are so good when they aren't in fear yeah and quite often it's a maternal, so a cat that's just had kittens or something, and then a bird comes in and no, she really? starts to. <laughs> Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. It depends on the animal. It depends on their sense of, am I safe? Am I secure? Or have I had a hard start in life and I'm feeling I need to be a bit more defensive? And but they do. They have so much to teach us. They do. And they teach us this, this vulnerability. And Kellen is vulnerable. I mean, she's a quite a fierce feist her name actually means slender fair warrior it's gaelic and um she gave it to me when i met her and i'd never heard of it before so i had to look it up and then i discovered that it meant slender fair warrior and she's a small slim warrior cat um so I'm like, oh, yeah that fits um but she is that and she is vulnerable sometimes i mean she's got very used to us now and she she's bonded with me so at first it was like you'd go to touch her you know what's going to happen and we went, we went through all that which takes time and now we're three years down the road and there's a picture somewhere on LinkedIn I put up the other day um, and I was totally being held well it's not the one being held down but I was totally being got and she had lain upside down on my lap, head down towards my feet and her back feet up like this. And she was just purring, you know, dozing. She was off catnapping, as they say. And she was totally vulnerable, stomach, everything, throat. And that's fine. You know? Totally in trust. Yeah. And that's the thing. <clears throat> we don't have that very much between humans, do we? Quite often we haven't. We have learnt and we've sometimes been explicitly taught to mm -hmm. fear. Yeah. Yeah. And if you think this is our solar plexus, like the cat mm -hmm. exposing the belly, and our solar plexus is, is pretty much exposed yeah. to people, to their energies. Yeah. And we can get a bit you can watch people's body language, can't you? Mm -hmm. Where we start to yeah. curl in and it closes off yeah. this part so our solar plexus is there as our radar to see is everything okay in the environment but also when we shut down it closes off our heart mm -hmm. and then making those connections is really difficult and it's it we do need to make those connections and i was um i was down in our little town this morning and it's it's a pretty friendly little town it's very small um and most people are good with it. But there are some, some tourists there already. We're in the middle of a, a lovely walking area, so we get tourists. And they were all a little bit like this, you know. And then I was coming coming down the road. I, I'm I'm crippled. I, I walk along with a stick, um, which is a very good idea because otherwise I fall over on without it. 
And so I was coming down the road and there was this little old lady coming up towards me. And um, so she moved slightly to one side for me and I moved slightly to one side for her. And as we went past, we went, and it was so lovely. I know, I have no idea who she is. I've not, I've never met her. Um, but there was that link. And we both trusted. I would say she's very solid in her own body. And, you know, I might be old. I might be a little bit frail, but I know who I am. And I'm fine with that. Hi, who are you? And it was all that kind of feel. And we don't get that very much. And when you were last around town, you think about this, everybody, for a minute. When you were last around town, how many people smiled at you? And how many people could you smile back at? And how many people made eye contact? And this will vary across the country. Yes, it does. Because there are slight differences in culture yeah. and what's normal and mm -hmm. therefore acceptable. I grew up in Ireland and then moved to Manchester and to Bristol, to Greater London, and now to Wales. And seeing the differences in each of those places, and obviously it's quite pronounced in London, it's quite famous in London, because it's such a busy, crammed space yes. that people keep their space by not making so much contact with others. Yeah. Whereas here in Wales, it's very rural in the area where we are. So we have loads of space. Yeah. And we didn't really know our neighbours very well in Bristol. We could chat to the people that we were connected to either side, but we didn't know anybody else, really. Yeah. Here in Wales, we don't have anybody that we can see from our house, mm -hmm. but we know our neighbours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we find, we find the same thing here. I mean, um, I'm not physically, the house is not physically connected to anywhere. It's at the end of a quarter of a mile of muddy cut farm track. Um, and my nearest neighbor, neighbor is a quarter of a mile away. But we know each other. And the farmer down the road, we know. And, the, you know, this woman who, who does eggs, we know her down there. And you know people. And that's partly because we all do have space. So I don't have to go around with my aura, for want of a better word, my energy feeling it's got to be like this. I can be out here and I'm not bouncing off somebody else. And that's really important too. And you can touch, I mean, even in the town. In high summer, yeah, it can get crowded. And then you really sort of like, mm, I think I'll come down on the Monday morning at eight o'clock next time. Um, but it it can get too much because you're too close. And we and if you're used to living with more space, mm -hmm. then you feel it more intensely. Mm -hmm. And it's like that thing of if you live in the city, to go out into the country can be quite overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And particularly if you live maybe in America and perhaps in somewhere like New York, mm -hmm. and then to go out into one of the big parks like Shenandoah or something, mm -hmm. we're like, oh, my goodness. But when I went to the States just to see that the horizon was so far away, mm -hmm. we don't even in this country, though we have space, we, we don't have that concept of space. Or if you go to the desert near where my stepson lives and it's just miles and miles and miles and miles, we don't have a concept of that really, do we? we don't. But it, it's those contrasts and, and it feels strange. So for me to go back into the time now, or if I was to go to London, yeah. feels overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's what we get used to and therefore what our wilderness yeah. is. And, and when your wild side um gets used to being in, to changing between the two, then it becomes easier to handle. But you have to know, it's a little bit like Kellen learning not to bite hard again. Um, this much is, is good here. And then, you know, when I'm on the train going to London, um, which I still do, uh, we lived, I lived in London for 25 years. So, you know, I was very used to that then it's like, okay, now we need to pull in. And we need to make sure that, you know, I'm not bumping too many other people with my energy and that they've got something solid to bounce against. They're not going to come right in here and out there again. 
So you change your boundaries and your energy boundaries and you'll feel, they feel boundaries, aren't they? That's probably the easiest way for people to think of it. It's, it and I guess it's like emotional intelligence. You get a mm. sense of space intelligence yeah. and yeah. flexibility, yeah. which comes through awareness and being conscious and being able to kind of, okay, I'm going to have them there, but they're going to be reasonably firm today because like you say, they're going to be bouncing up against other people's, whereas where I am right now, there's nobody else really to bounce up against. No, no. I've got yeah. plenty of space. Yeah, and the trees and the birds around me are quite happy. Oh, it's her again, yeah. <laughs> and it, it's fine. So, yes, you learn to do this kind of thing. But that's sort of like the beginning of finding your wild inside. It's actually finding your edges. Well, we define one by the other, don't we? This is me, that is other. Yes. To a degree, because there's a, a, an element of that, but then there's the paradox. I just love paradoxes of this is me, that is other, but actually we're all one. Yeah. Well, okay, then let's have another scientific paradox, which everybody mostly knows. Light is both particles and waves right. at the same time. It is. Young's light yeah. experiment. Absolutely. And uh, again, lovely little videos on YouTube to show you this. And it isn't either or, it's and. Both and. Yeah, which takes me to my other favourite mathematician, George Boole, um, British bloke, a couple hundred years ago. And his concepts of and, which is this is not either or, this is and, you know, Ellen and Robin, Robin and Ellen, and that we wouldn't be having the laptops and the phones and the computers that we are now watching each other on, that we're talking to you through. We wouldn't have those without George Bull's concept of and. So it goes everywhere. It really does. does. Yeah. Yeah. And so have we been wild this, this afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> I think we've bounced around a lot. We have. We didn't get terribly far into the Enchanted Forest, but how about we talk about the Enchanted Forest and all the things in there a little bit, start off that one next time? That would be great. And we also didn't get to really talking about the birds. You mentioned in your LinkedIn post that we were going to get talk about the birds and the bird song, which is really starting. I noticed it yesterday morning, particularly, that we've got the dawn chorus back. Because yeah. the birds don't stop. They're still there, the ones that stay over winter here. But just I'm noticing that they're really beginning to prepare and ramp up for the spring yeah. that hasn't quite sprung fully yet, but we're getting some incredible weather. Mm -hmm. So the birds are getting that ready and they're going to be nesting. And they're going to be having their chicks. So we've got all that to look forward to. And we've seen, I've certainly seen here, I've seen several courting couples of birds um, we've got two pairs, at least, of robins here. Um, it's very hard to tell Mr. and Mrs. Robin apart. Um, and they tend to, um, Mr. Robins tend to have lots of Mrs. Robinses anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's what they do. That's okay. Um, but we've got a couple of blackbird pairs and he's feeding her. Oh. It's just the last couple of days. He's feeding her. I've been watching it. So it's all ramping up. So mm -hmm. maybe we ought to be talking about that next time because it should yeah. be a swing by the time we're talking again, won't it? It'll be pretty much getting there, yes. Yeah. Towards the end of March, it'll be time for clocks to change and yeah. get into <clears throat> the summertime. Absolutely. The, like British summertime here. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what we'd really like is please get on to whichever – social media channel you find this on and we're going to it's going to be on several um and for both of us so you just catch one of us and you'll get it and ask some questions tell us what's happening for you yeah. and ask some questions that you'd like us to involve in our talk because it'd be great and it's about connecting this wild side inside and letting it be a bit open letting it be a bit vulnerable actually coming out you know flowering like in the spring and 
tell us about that and we'll bring that all into the chat next week next next month actually. next month yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so anything that you'd like us to explore, anything you'd like us to talk around, any topics that you think would be really good to discuss, yeah, we're open for any ideas. We are, as long as they're wild. Oh, yes. <laughs> but I'm sure we'll bring wild in. I can't imagine we wouldn't. No, I can't indeed. So I hope you've enjoyed it. It's been great for me. It's been great for you too, Robert. Yeah. Yeah, it's always great to talk about this stuff. It always is. So we'll see you next month. And be on, it'll be on the, all our social media channels. We'll be telling you when it is. Lots of stuff. So maybe just to say where we are. I'm on, we're both on LinkedIn, both on yeah. Facebook, both Instagram. Facebook. And YouTube. Yeah. yeah. But just in terms of the posting to find out when it's going to be on YouTube. Um, well, yes, that would be more difficult. So Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram. We'll share the links on there. We will, and you will be able to find them there. And we'll keep doing it for several days. So it's not just that one and where she put it, I've lost it. <laughs> and with the, if you only do it once with the Facebook algorithms or the social media algorithms, it's so easy to miss. So, yeah, um, it'll be posted several times. And on the YouTube, you can subscribe. Yeah. So that'd be fine. Lovely to be with you all. And see you all next month. Thank you for joining us. Please drop your thoughts, questions and any suggestions for future discussion topics in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed listening, then share with your networks. Tune in next month for the next episode of Wild Inside with Robin Harris and Ellen Sentier.